Bees really are the critical element to the food on our plates. I can't stress that strongly enough. Hidden on rooftops across Melbourne's CBD is a food producing operation you'd expect to see in the country. And turns out city life's actually pretty good for honeybees. There's loads of pollen with the plane trees around. We've got uh, you know, tea tree in, in the Docklands area. We've got Parliament Gardens, the Botanic Gardens, Flagstaff Gardens. Um, so from, a, from an aerial point of view, it's a really green city and the bees do really well in the CBD. Matt Lumalasi started Rooftop Honey a decade ago and now has 140 hives. Having the bees flying above our heads without us even realising they're there, it works really well. And it shows that humans can be in the same space as bees and, and get along quite fine. They're, they're not aggressive, stinging insects out to get humans. It's twice the cost of supermarket honey, but Matt sells every jar. For some customers, it's about local pride. For others, concern about food miles. But mostly, it's a growing understanding about the importance of bees. The awareness that has come from our business is amazing. We, uh, when we started out, um, councils in metropolitan Melbourne were still destroying colonies and were deeming them as a pest in a public space. Uh, ten years later, I don't think there's any council now that would destroy a, a hive of bees. Overseas, bee populations have been hit hard by colony collapse disorder caused by diseases, agricultural chemicals and habitat loss. So far, Australia has escaped. We've got the healthiest, cleanest bees in the world um, and that's why we can command such a good price for our Australian honey in international markets, whether it be Japan or the US or the UK or Germany. There's growing recognition just how precious bees are. It's not just honey, it's the pollination services they provide, worth a staggering $170 billion a year worldwide. A third of the world's food relies on pollinators. Bees really are the critical element to the food on our plates. I can't stress that strongly enough. To reach the National Farmers Federation's goal of Australian agriculture being worth $100 billion by 2030, there needs to be a massive 67% increase in production in just a decade. Queensland is doing its bit. Horticulture is booming, with big expansion in avocado, macadamia, melon and blueberry industries, to name a few. But there are fears there just won't be enough bees. We need close to 30,000 more hives by 2030 just to, just to fulfil pollination services in Queensland alone. Years of drought have smashed Australia's bee numbers. Organic honey producer Rob Dewar's production dropped 80% in 2019. After a terrible year, summer was the worst he's ever experienced. While protecting his own home from bushfire, he heard his hives were also under threat in a national park in southeast Queensland. He rescued them with an hour to spare, but there was no escape for his hives in Coffs Harbour. And we moved them down there. Unfortunately, it was in fairly unaccessible country, one road in, one road out. So when the fires hit and it started from a dry lightning storm, we couldn't get to them in time. But the industry has suffered greatly. Um, beekeeping nationally have lost close to 20,000 hives. I think the numbers could climb too. Some bee beekeepers haven't been able to get into some hives yet. So unfortunately there are going to be some really sad stories out there. Last year Rob drove thousands of kilometres in search of flowers. Despite recent rain, he's still driving. We've got bees at the moment near Townsville and next week we're probably going to go for a drive to Quilpie and Aramanga in the Channel Country in southwest Queensland. So it's a pretty big area that we cover, as far south as Forbes. So wherever it rains, generally beekeepers migrate to that area. Murray Arkadeef had an equally bad year, but kept his bees close to home near the Gold Coast because of his worries about bushfires. 
keep his bees alive over summer, Mari Arkadev fed them a one-to-one -one mix of white sugar and water. And once a week, he came here and filled up these 200 litre wheelie bins with sugar syrup. That kept 10 million bees alive, but he had nine other sites. So all up, he was feeding 100 million bees. This year, the last, say, 12 months, we haven't produced any honey at all, so we've had a complete loss of income. Uh, we have, the bees have basically nearly starved uh, through the summer as the florals uh, all dried up. Ryan Dalmeda heads up Capilano, Australia's biggest honey cooperative. Ryan, what has the drought done to honey supplies for Capilano? Oh, honey supplies have been decimated. Um, the last 12 months with both the, the drought, then the bushfires, has literally halved the honey supply in Australia. This is the, this is the, the worst honey crop we've seen in, in history. How long do you envisage it'll be on the market? Look, this will be on the market, I reckon, for as long as Australians keep getting behind it, and as long as we can keep raising money for the drought and bushfire, um, we'll, we'll keep it on shelves. Honey prices are the highest ever, but many beekeepers are struggling. So Capilano's donating money to HiveAid. It's been a real effort to try and get the beekeepers to reach out and ask for help because they're so proud. Um, whether it be for uh, water or for or food or for diesel or whatever it might be, uh, we've been really trying to encourage the beekeepers to, to reach out and accept the funding that's available for them. Before the COVID-19 outbreak, Capilano made the rare move to look at importing honey from South America. The industry's outlook here won't be known until spring. Look, we've had some rain, um, but we all know that um, we need the trees to flower and some trees flower in alternate years. So it's going to, it's going to be sporadic in terms of how this honey comes on. Um, spring, we'll, we'll get our first look into what supply is going to be like, but we're planning for uh, continuation of these, of, these, of these terrible conditions. So it's anyone's guess, you really don't know? Nobody knows. Millions of hectares of bee feeding flora on the eastern seaboard and Kangaroo Island were destroyed in fires so hot recovery could take years. In Queensland, a national park near Toowoomba, a favourite of beekeepers, looks to be recovering. But the green shoots are misleading. If the tree has lost its crown, so it's lost the main body of leaf on the top of the tree, if it's burnt and you see green shoots shooting up the trunk, in my opinion, that tree will never survive. It, they're just false sap growth trees. And eventually the, the roots will dry and the tree will fall over. Rob Dewar worries how the industry will replace the bees lost in the fires. You can't just wave a magic wand and all of a sudden have bees healthy and a healthy hive needs a healthy forest to, to be breeding those bees to, to be able to split and share into a new hive. If they don't have that rainfall and the, and, and the drought is still lingering on at the moment, I'm calling it a bit of a green drought, but if we don't get that consistent rainfall, it'll take years to, for us to recover. After much lobbying, the Queensland Government has offered help. So the government in total gave us a $1 million package, which is unprecedented within the industry. We were so excited um, to receive something of that nature. It's, um, like I said, it's a first in Queensland's history. $650,000 was allocated towards the fee waiver, with a further $350,000 being provided as a sugar supplementation package directly from the government. But the government hasn't given the industry a reprieve from a 2024 deadline banning beekeepers from national parks, which provide a fifth of their apiary sites. The health of our industry is going to be on its knees. It's something that is a strong concern to all of us moving forward. How can we have the security of a, you know, a successful and sustainable future without something so fundamentally important? We're talking about occupying small pockets of land for a few weeks at a time, possibly not returning them to them for three and four years at a time. You know, that tiny little footprint really has an everlasting effect and if this is locked in place then um, the government's going to have a lot to question and answer, a lot to answer for. So. The deadline was set 17 years ago and beekeepers have been fighting it ever since.
If there was somewhere else to go, it would already be there. Uh, there isn't anywhere else to go. What's going to happen to the people who want to grow horticulture in Queensland if the government sticks to 2024? They'll see significant uh, falls in their production. There's no question about that. You know, whether you, uh, you're in um, citrus, avocados, blueberries, almonds, if we're not providing the bees in the large numbers that they require, then they're simply just not going to hit the production targets they need. That's something that um, will uh, impact all our businesses. My business will stall and so will theirs. Using native stingless bees as pollinators could be one answer. Some of the crops that are pollinated by stingless bees that we know from research are efficiently pollinated by stingless bees are expanding rapidly and we're seeing an increased demand for honeybees for pollination. So I think the increased demand for our stingless bees is going to be significant and a large uh, and plenty of opportunities for, for stingless beekeepers to fill that gap. Former CSIRO entomologist Tim Hurd sells stingless bees and hives. Enthusiasm from backyarders is so strong, there's a waiting list. We have a customer who lives on the 12th floor of an apartment in the centre of Brisbane, almost at South Brisbane, and she keeps them very successfully, way up at that height. Outside the city, a trial at a Sunshine Coast macadamia orchard shows they're doing the job. Apart from being stingless, native bees aren't susceptible to most of the diseases which affect the European honeybee. But they don't like the cold, so Sydney is as far south as they'd work. Tim is torn about the looming closure of national parks to traditional beekeepers. I support the argument that national parks really are relatively small parts of our landscapes that should be kept for native plants and animals. But on the other point of view, from the, on, but on the other hand, I also see that uh, our national parks are, are one of the few places that can keep bees going through the poor times to enable them to be used for crop pollination. Uh, my grandfather used to say, another day, another adventure. Because no two days would be the same. Um, you'd be in a different, beautiful location in Australia. You're always in the bush. So people that love the bush, love the outdoors. It's really a good industry to get into. Rob Dewar believes the national park ban is driving down confidence among current beekeepers and deterring younger ones from joining an industry which, in his words, not mine, has a lot of greying, wrinkly beekeepers. But despite all the challenges, he's still positive about the future. The markets and the, the opportunities for beekeeping in Queensland and in Australia as a whole is, 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 is huge. You know, the, the emerging market of Manuka honey or the medical grade honey. You know, we're talking about an industry at the moment of a, about, worth about $60 million, just our little industry. And we could easily have a billion dollar industry in medical grade honey. We could easily double the amount of bees in Queensland if we get the security of these sites. And that's what we'll be able to do if government just gets out of our way.